കുർബാനം God bless you, Brother Upshaw. I was so happy to see him. I didn't think he would get back in time, but he was telling me being up in Gothenburg and many places and met thousands of my friends in, in the Scandinavian countries. I'm very happy to get to see him again. He said he got an infection in his feet. Missionaries have a hard time, Brother Upshaw. <laughs> I've had some of my own. I, I know what it is to, to be a missionary. They confront everything. all kinds of perils and dangers and sicknesses and diseases and so forth, but God delivered him out of them all. The God that could heal you has been in the for, for 66 years, since you're a teacher of an athletic foot, Kenny, that is right. Now, today I am very happy to be here. I never knew, and I, when I come, I told you that coming in this place without air conditioning and under the circumstances and everybody tell me you're going to the graveyard, boy, they all die in Chicago <laughs> and so forth. Not to go, but the Holy Spirit told me to go. And I minded the Holy Spirit. And yesterday afternoon, little did I know that what was taking place, but it did last night. Something happened last night. You'll hear of it later. It was just before it happened, I said, Yesterday afternoon, I didn't know my boy was over there in the bed. It went out and got hot and it fell a little ill and couldn't come in in his service. I thought he was down here giving out prayer cards. And I found him over there in the bed and I said to the wife, I said, something is just fixing to happen. I don't know, there's something strange. And then I went on down, I went over to Billy Baxter's room, his prayer room, where he's got. I went in, I said, Billy Baxter, something is just fixing to happen. He said, you think anything's wrong, Billy Branham? I said, no. It's to, it's to the good. It's the angel of the Lord fixing to do something. And then last evening, here he did it. You were here at last night's meeting for a long time. And now, I'm at liberty now. The Holy Spirit, there may be many more things happen during the time of service, but I see now from the depths of my soul why the Holy Spirit sent me here to this place. Now this afternoon, It's my privilege to speak about uh, concerning the spiritual things or my life story in the spiritual line. And I just spoke to Sister Upshaw, and she says that they're going to be here a couple days, so no doubt they'll be speaking, and you'll be very happy to hear them uh, speak of their tour and about the Upshaw's healing. I know you'd all like to hear you tell about it tonight out there and how the The Holy Spirit revealed who he was, where he come from, all about his life, and, and spoke his healing. After being an invalid for many years, lay in a wheelchair, rolled on a bed, and uh, so forth, and then finally after being a man up in his 80s, then God in his infant mercy spoke to him and now made a missionary out of him after he's 80-something years old. That's God. That's God working. And so I look for the hook show to see that virgin so he can tell it himself, his sister, and let uh, you hear the story of how it happened. Now, I, by the way, that gives me just a very good start to what I'm going to speak about is God in his, his uh, infant uh, mercy and his, his sovereignty and his will how God does things, and it's all through an act of grace of God, nothing that we have to do with it. Now, first, I want to read some scripture, and then I won't take too much time because I want you back here tonight. For I believe after the breaking forward last evening of this which I have looked forward to see, now, of course, anything can happen now. See, now it's free. The Satan has pushed so hard, maybe you'll stop now. after he tried to keep that out. And I didn't know about it until I, when I got home and I began, I told the wife, I said, something taking place, I can't make it out, was in the meeting. Something happened that seems to be, and then they let me alone at nighttime, and this morning after I came back around in normal condition again, Mr. Baxter came over and said, Brother Branham, and he began to reveal it, what had taken place last night. I said, there it is. That's it. 
I knew then with the Holy Spirit that what the Lord wanted to hear. Now, not tonight, we're expecting something great from our Lord. The time is drawing short now. And this morning, definitely, I was definitely led for after the closing of this meeting to begin next week in Zion, Illinois, right around the bend. And so I know the Holy Spirit is leading me that way. One thing by promise that I gave the people years ago, it was a, a certain thing that happened there that someone had been before, but I told the people when I left Zion, I said, I will return, and a man of honor will keep his word. And then I thought sometime, and now just while we're in this center, it seems like he's leading me around there, there's a great a stadium place or arena down there in Chicago sitting waiting if the Holy Spirit should leave. There's one sitting there, Battle Creek waiting, there's one out of twin, twin cities waiting, there's an auditorium sitting out here to see 10,000 people free, 500 ministers laying at my house, Methodist, Baptist, and all different kinds of their name on a paper to cooperate, but it's where the Holy Spirit says move. Now, you might tell me to go out here to a little place where there'd be ten people in a church. It's just where he says go. That's always best, isn't it? Yeah. It's always best. Just leave, leave it to him. Leave it to him. Now, you just keep praying for me, and I'm asking the Lord uh, for something that you will just speak to me and tell me that, that I can do. If you just do that for me, I'll be so happy. It's nothing for myself. It's not no... Nothing for only give me more strength and, and so that I can stand longer in the meetings. But it's something I want him to do so I can help his people. It's not in gifts and callings and things, them things are, that was made up back under before the world began. I can't get out of his predestinated will. He's already willed me what to do. But it's just something I would like to do along another line. And I would like for him to tell me that I could do it. Nothing about gifts, but just so much. All right, now I want to read... Maybe a few scriptures. I'll read one here anyhow and quote a few more to you. Now, I told you I would tell you my life story this afternoon. Next Sunday, maybe my life story in the regular form. But this Sunday, I want to speak on the spiritual side. How many Christians is in here? Let's see your hands. Way up high. That's, I believe it's 100% flat Christian. Or at least 99 and 9 tenths. Right. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me up in the balcony all right? Over here? Over there? Okay, well, that's fine. I just thought maybe I, I wasn't speaking loud enough. And looks like with all this around here, I should be. Somebody ought to hear it. Well, hey, this mass is like being over in Africa again, uh, Brother Jackson, so that uh, uh, so many microphones. And Africa, if you'd, you'd interpret all the, the interpreters, you'd say Jesus Christ is the Son of God. and. You would be one tribe that says something or other, and then wait, you'd have to wait for the next man he interprets for his tribe, and the next down for his tribe, and the next, well, you go get a sandwich, time to get back to say something else almost. Time to went through all the interpreters. But God was there. They was listening to every move. And they listened eagerly. You talk about sitting in a hot room. They sit there in the tropical storms and the lightnings and the solid flash everywhere and the rain pouring into their face. They just sit there in those black backs, just cut there and listen, waiting. Not only the black man, the brown man, the yellow man, the white man, and all of them sit right there. Ladies, well-dressed, just drenched, sitting there by the thousands of them storms are going. Those Mohammeds sitting there in the, sitting there in the long hair, women like that, and just drenched. And when you walk up like that, they'd fall on their face and holler, scream out, just fall right past you on the ground. A spirit of worship. They call me Corishioner. <laughs> Corishioner is one of their gods, you know, and so we had, they heard me saying Christ, and they didn't understand English, so they thought I said Corishioner. So they thought it was Corishioner, their incarnated God. And so we stopped them and told them it was Christ the Son of God, that I was his servant, and that's what these things are doing. For sitting right in the meeting, out through there, the people at language, you'd see the Spirit of God move over somebody, and you'd have them to stand, and when you speak the interpreters, they'd have to look to see who it was, and then maybe a language, maybe they'd go to give in that vision, two different languages like that, and tell them where they was at, and what they'd done, and what was wrong with them, where they'd been, and the Lord would heal them. And then them people would just scream and fall over, it was God, that was, that, they, was they was ready. 
Now, in Jeremiah, I want to read a, a portion of the Word. I want to read from the first chapter and the fourth and fifth verse of Jeremiah. And then from there I'll quote two or three scriptures, and then try to get off the platform within an hour, if I possibly can, so you have time to go home and get back. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah the prophet speaking, Before I found thee in the belly, I knew thee. I look, before I found thee, I knew thee. And before thou comest forth from the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet, unto the nation. Then said I, O oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. Now, the reason I read this, now what I want to say, in my preaching, I just want to explain something, and I want all of you to try to give me your undivided attention if you can. And now, remember, now, to, especially to these ministers over here. I may be way out of line on these things. If I am, I am ignorantly out of line. Uh, I do not know any difference. And the only thing that I know of by the scriptures comes to me directly by revelation. See? So that's the way, that I, the only way I know it. And if it does not just tally with the way that you believe, I'll ask you this as my brother, my sister, not to fall out with me, but to bear with me, for I'll be the weak one then. And, uh, and, I, and pray for me that God will lead me into the light, what is true. See? If I be wrong on my scripture, explain. For as I said earlier night, I don't know too much about the word, the book. I just know the author real well, the, the one who wrote it, the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, to hear Jeremiah, before he was even formed, before he even came into the world, before he had his first existence, before the germ ever become a germ, then God knew him, he said, and he would sanctify him and ordained him a prophet to the nations before he was even born. Now, the first thing I'm getting to there is to know this, that it is God's grace that any of you are saved today. It wasn't your will to be saved. Man by nature is a, is a rebellion against God. And he rebelled in the Garden of Eden. He's fallen from grace and run from God and hid from God in his nature of man to do that. Now the Bible also says, gifts and calling are without repentance. Not what you repented, not know your righteousness, not Gifts and callings are without repentance. It's God's foreknowledge of what he has. That I believe that God in the Garden of Eden, before the Garden of Eden, I believe that God knew the end from the beginning. I, I believe that. And everything in the great clock, the great picture is just moving in and nothing can stop it. It's going to be just exactly according to what God said it would be. Now, I think to you and I, and the best things that we can do as advising you as God's servant, weighing every word that I'm saying, because I realize this, and I'm in contact today with about six or eight million people. Watching, they watch the words that I say, they weigh what I say. They, the anomalous world, the church, doctors, lawyers, monarchs, Watching, been in the meetings, great man healed. And they've watched it, they've weighed it up. They'll ride in and tell me, but many of them, like Nicodemus, don't. They walk in at nighttime or ride in or something like that, but afraid to walk to the platform and say, I take my side with it. I've never been ashamed, and God helped me to always be man enough to stand up and speak my conviction. Well, if I'm not, I'd be a traitor to Christ. I believe in the old-fashioned baptizing of the Holy Ghost. I believe that a man's got to be born again or he's still a sinner. I believe it's only through the grace of God that he's called in the Holy Ghost 
We do not receive the Holy Ghost by faith believing. It's the free gift of God given to us by God's grace. That's where I differ with my own church. The church that I come from, the Baptist church, they said, you receive the Holy Ghost when you believe. I said, that's contrary to the Bible. Paul said in Acts 19, he asked those Baptists up there that were following a palace, he said, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? Not when you believe, but since you have believed. You believe first, and the Holy Ghost is the gift of God. He comes to you. It's a different, a little bit different from being saved, being called out, and God. Now, therefore, you have to see, I, I believe that man's spirit was made before all the supernatural was made before the natural. I believe that everything in the natural line works in harmony or should with the spiritual. In other words, like this, when a baby is born, when a person is born to the spirit ministers, there's three elements that came from the body of Christ to make up the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? Water, blood, spirit. That's just what come out of his body. Is that true? Well, that's just exactly the elements it takes to go through to get into his body. The elements that came. That constitutes the new birth. Three elements, water, blood, spirit. Now watch this. In the natural realms, when a baby's born in this world, what's the first thing in a normal birth? Water, blood, life. Is that right? Spirit. Three things, all the things of the natural. Or if we had time this afternoon just to dwell right in there and show you what workings of demons are. Maybe I will. A couple of afternoons this week, I want to speak myself to any afternoon meeting on what demonology. People speak to demons and don't know what they are. When you're out just having some kind of a thought, well, demons are this or that, but when you meet face to face and converse with them, and they try to move you in some other way, and I'll say this, friends, my Bible opened before me this afternoon, I've only when demons has met me and I've spoke to them, not just some mythical makeup or think or feel or power, I mean talk face to face as I would with you. And I've tried this to be sure. I've had them stand there and look. And I'd say, now, I don't mean the, uh, some person that's possessed with a demon. I mean the form outline of a demon standing there like a dark shadow speaking and a threaten at me. And I'd say, you're wrong. And you know you're wrong. For it's written in the scripture. See? He'd stand there and I'd say, answer me. And he wouldn't answer me. I'd say, in the name of high heaven, answer me. And he wouldn't do it. Now, I've called him all kinds of names. But whenever you name that name, Jesus Christ, he'll answer. I've seen it. I know it. God knows as a witness as I stand here this afternoon. That is the truth. But brother and sister, you better know what you're doing. You better be careful, and you better be sure that you understand. Don't walk out there and stay right where God's called you until you know what you're doing. For it's a dangerous thing. Now, of course, there are things that God has revealed, and I'm not wanting you to think that I'm a mystic. I am not a mystic. I am a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. But there's things in the spiritual world that you can't speak out to people. The closest person to me, I guess, in the world is my son and my wife, as I know of, my mother. And they don't know no more about it, and I've told them no more than I tell you, because it's an individual affair. But now, gifts and callings are without repentance. If God sees the hour, sees the place, sets the thing in order, and it happens just that way. Now, there's no way at all to try to, to get out of that because it's going to happen. Now the thing for every individual to find is his place in God. What God has called you to do and then abide in that place. What if this afternoon I try to change my meetings and like uh, Brother Roberts over here is holding here. Someone come to me and said, Brother Branham, Roberts prays for 500 while you pray for two. I said, but I am not Brother Roberts. See. Brother Roberts, God tells him what to do. That's between God and Brother Roberts. Brother Roberts is my dear friend. 
I love Brother Roberts. Before he ever started his healing service, he sat in the front row like that and walked right behind the platform and talked to me. On healing, when he seen it done, just hold a little meeting for a man over there in Kansas City. He was along Brother Dodds, what's going to happen? We got a picture. It's the same night, standing together. And Brother Roberts can organize his meetings. He knows where he's going to be two years from now. His meetings are already set up with all the ministers cooperating and bringing him together and sponsoring of his meetings and things like that. And everybody's looking forward to it and planning for two years from now. The only thing keeping him from doing it would be tell something that was wrong or either die. I can't set my meetings like that. Mine's a different ministry. I might be here tonight and in the morning God might send me to Battle Creek, Michigan. And the meeting will close in the morning. And I can't, that's the reason I don't have paper. I started with that voice of healing one time, no more. <laughs> you see how that went. All right. You can't do it. You can't, in, now, now, does that say Brother Robert and Barry, man of God, all of them, I believe everyone that professes to be a Christian is a Christian if he lives a life. And I think Brother Roberts is a good man. I think Brother here, Tommy Osborne is one of the finest little Christian men I ever met, nearly. Tommy Osborne. He's a man after my own heart, a convert to divine healing in my own meeting. We stood down that that night at uh, Portland, seen that maniac run the platform to our brick every bone in your body, you hypocrite. I was just speaking. That man weighed some 300 pounds, arms about like that. Said he, he, he said, you hypocrite, you snake in the grass. 500 preachers about moved back, shrank back, and Brother Baxter was with them. Moved back. Two little priests that I just led to God went out there to grab the man. I said, this is not a flesh and blood affair. 6,600 people sitting, or 6,600 people sitting besides what was in the street, everybody breathless. I weighed 128 pounds then. I turned around to him, never said a word. You better know what you're talking about. So he said, Tonight, I'll prove that there's nothing to you but a hypocrite. He said, I'll break every bone in that little frail body of yours. And he drew up them arms, and he was well able to carry out his threat, physically speaking. He's come walking towards me with his teeth set, his eyes were rolling like that. He went, got real close to me, and said, <clears throat> spit in my face. He said, you snake in the grass, you, you posing to be a man of God. I never said a word. I was waiting for the angel of the Lord to speak. Mine was no good. And he said, tonight I'll break every bone in your body. I'll knock you in the middle of that congregation out there. Just about that time, something like I said, tonight, because you made this challenge, you'll fall over my feet. Thus saith the Lord. There you are. Now, 6,600 people waiting, breathless. Both challenges was made. I had to look up like at the scene. He said, I'll show you whose feet I'll fall over you, snake in the grass. And here he come like that, drew back his big fist, and just got ready to strike me. He did like I said, Satan come out of the man. And when he did, he said, <laughs> he turned around like that, his eyes burst out, his tongue flew from his mouth. He rolled around the floor and fell over my feet and pinned me on the floor so the police had to roll him off of my feet before he'd get up. Now, both prophecies were made, there it was at hand. Tommy eyes were happy to be sitting looking at that. He went home, got him a hammer and nails, and nailed the door up and said, I ain't coming out of here, God, you do something for me. He said, I'm staying right here. He prayed for several days. He come down and sitting on the porch, Brother Bosworth was sitting there with me. He said, Brother Brandon, do you think God will answer my prayer? I said, now look, Brother Osborne, get started on the right foot. Now you can make a lot of noise or anything and people will follow you, but remember your ministry, you'll answer before God for some day. I said, there's just an old tree on that porch referring to Brother Bosworth. I said, who knows about divine healing? Crawl up under the tree and talk to him a little while. I said, if you'd been called with a gift, you'd have known it way back on a gifts and callings without repentance. You are at least a preacher, and every preacher, by general orders, are to pray for the sick. Not only the preachers, but the deacons and the lay members, pray you one for another. Every Christian in here has just as much right to pray for the sick as I, Brother Bosworth, Brother Baxter, Brother Roberts, or any other man there is. 
What does that man do? The only thing they can do is preach the word of God so clear that you accept it and accept it. There's nothing in the man that would heal, nothing in his prayer that would heal. It's not your heal. Here's the sort of guy saying you're maybe he's saying you're an unbeliever. Now I could pray for him all night long with a toothache. You're never healing. He's got to have the faith. It's that man. If it wasn't I could heal him. But he's got to have the faith in Christ to receive his healing. See what I mean? So Brother Osborne did just that. He got with Brother Bosworth and stayed with him for about a year or so, I guess, or something like that. Different places together until he found all the techniques of how to use the scriptures. I met him here not long ago in New York. When he was sent in Cuba there in different places, the many 20 and 30,000 people in the congregation said, Are you tired, Brother Osborne? He said, I've never laid my hand on a person. I said, how long have to be told about? Just preach 30 minutes and go home. I said, how do you do it? He said, brother, I stand out there and I take the word of God. and I don't come talking about any gifts and things like this. The gift that I have is explain the word of God. He said, and the word of God will defeat Satan, and that's the truth. It will defeat Satan anywhere, any place, any time. And he begins to explain and tell, and just move in that word like that, so Satan's so webbed in that he can't move. The audience sees it. He said, how many of you believe it now and want to accept it? They raise their hands like that to come up here and testify. Brother Osborne gets in the chair and sits down and listens for about three hours and testify. Say, hallelujah. Go on home. Come back the next night and explain it again. Get the work done of the Lord. The man is right. Absolutely 100% right. And he is no fundamentalist and nobody else can put a finger on it because there it is in the word of the Lord. You got a right to question? You question God then on it. Tommy Osborne one of the most powerful evangelists in the fields today in the realm of divine healing because he knows the word of the Lord in the Bible. Now, gifts and callings. Now let's get back to what they are. God sets them aside. God places them in the church as he will. God gives suddenly as he will. Is that right? Not as I will, but as he will. Now if God wanted me to be a, a lay member of the church, I'd be better off a lay member than I would to be a preacher. See? Because I'll only bring reproach somewhere along the line. It'll be something that'll bring reproach. If he called me to be a deacon, it's better for me to be a deacon. It would be to be a minister. But if he called me to be a minister, I'd be better off a minister than I would be a lay member. It's wherever God has called us and set us in the church for his service. Then we fit better. Now, I want to give you, with that background, I'll give you the experience of my life. Many people have misunderstood me, dear Christian friends. I'm, I'm misunderstood today. I, I try to make it as plain as I can yet in all of it. There's no way at all for me to get it to the people. It's got to be a revelation coming from God to understand it. Okay. Now, this, this gentleman sitting here, a congressman of the United States, how long was he in Congress? About 17 years, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, nine years, eight years. Eight years as a congressman. He was a senator, I believe a judge, and many high offices, and was a cripple from a little bitty boy. How did I know that man? I never heard of him, and God knows to that day I never heard of him in my life. I don't read of congressmen and statesmen and so forth. I, I had a grammar school education, the rest of my education was with a hoe out in the field somewhere, or a pair of mules. See? I, I never knew much about him politics or anything. Now, the only thing that I knew out there at night was my rifle in the woods and my dog in a lantern, I learned that there was a creator and by supernatural ways. Then by revelation, by vision, by power, God spoke that man's life out to me. Not only that, but here every night. There has been no meeting since I've been in America in the last year that my manager and son has told me has been any more balanced out with the pure, unadulterated powers of God moving through the church has been taking place right here in Hammond. In any of my meetings. Lay your finger on any of it. It's absolutely every time perfect. Is that right? Seeing things that's been done. Now, now. I'm told by my mother and my father, now my dad was a logger in the woods. My mother and father were married when my mother was 14 years old, 
and my dad was 18 years old. I was born when Mama was 15 years old. Just a child having a child. That was all. I was born only weighed five pounds. A little bitty fellow. I lived in a little old log cabin. The picture hangs in my house today that a person painted for me in California. I was a little old log cabin, and in there, in this little log cabin that morning on April the 6th, when the midwife opened up the window so the light could shine in to show, let Mama see what I looked like, and Papa, when they looked in, the, in there, there was a light come whirling through the window about the size of a pillow and circled around where I was and went down on the bed. Several of the mountain people were standing there. They were crying. My people back before me were Catholic. I'm Irish on both sides. And so they were, they, my people, not my mother and father, because they'd gotten away from the church. And then they didn't know what happened. Of course, you know how superstitious the mountain people is, that that young one that was born over yonder on the hill, you know, there was a light appeared over yonder in the room, wondering what kind of a young one it'll be, see? He'll be born somewhere, he'll be certain, certain things, you know, mountain people are. All right. Now, that was all I knew until I was about, all I knew of in the supernatural line until I was about three years old. My father was hauling logs with, with ox. I guess you never seen a yoke of ox. They used to drive them in the mountains there, and then they'd take all the logs and put them in the river and raft them, go down the Cumberland River into the, on down into Mississippi, or down uh, into the Ohio River, come down the Cumberland River and raft. And Pop was hauling logs with the ox with the other man, and one day as a little boy with my little brother who came on the scene then, who is in glory today, I had a rock, and I walked out behind the house where there was a little branch that run down behind the cabin, I take this rock and I throw it down in the mud and you know how a bunch of loggers would be, just about like a bunch of, of sailors, I guess, on the high sea. They always teasing me going on and I guess I was a pretty bad little boy. They'd tell me how big a muscle I had and how to blow it up with my thumb, you know, and I'd tell my little brother what a big muscle I had. And I'd throw it down at the rock like that and how deep it would fall in the mud. My little brother waddled his way back to the, towards the house we as far as Oh, 50 yards from the house, perhaps. He went back to the house, and I was still playing around the little branch. I heard a bird sitting up there, and the bird was chirping. And I looked at him, and he was whistling. Might have been a robin or something. A whistling, making a song. And then coming down to there came a voice. I remember, friends, this Bible lays open before me when I say this. Now, whether it comes from the bird, from the tree, I was just a laddie boy and didn't know. I cannot say. God knows I do not. But a voice spoke to me that I was going to live near a city called New Albany. And about a year from then, or less than a year, my father came to Indiana, and we lived within four miles now, and I've been raised within four miles of New Albany, Indiana. The next appearing that I knew of it, I was about seven years old. I'd entered school. In them days, the kiddies didn't go to school until I was about seven. I just entered school, and I loved fishing, and I wanted to go fishing, and I went out in the back of the pond, the old ice pond. Dad worked for a millionaire. Then as a chauffeur, and I... Was, and my father did which was wrong. These are the things I do not like to say, but brother, sister, when there's truth, no matter if it's against me or for me, I must tell the truth. My father did wrong. He was doing time of probation. He drank heavy, and he made what he drank and made it for others. Then, packing water I had to to one of those stills one night where him and another bunch of men, I could not go fishing. And I had to to pack the water and coming down along a lane which many people right here in this building now and I see Brother Ryan for one sitting here, Brother Bosworth for another sitting here, their Brother Baxter's near. I've taken them right to the place, they've seen the place and all about it. People come from Canada and everywhere going in there wanting to see that place. No where it's at. And there one spoke to me from out of a tall poplar tree 
It said, don't you never smoke, drink, or defile your body, for there's a work for you to do when you get older. Well, like this scared me to death. I run home, mother thought I was hurt or something and or bitten by a snake. Then a few days after that, setting, that was my first vision, setting out there under a big silver poplar tree in the front yard where two stands yet today, standing out there in the front of that place, I see something like yesterday afternoon, a feeling coming up on me that I never, I didn't know what it was. And a little bit, I moved off and I looked and I seen moving up out of those bushes down by the river. And along there came a big bridge and it spanned across the river. I seen men dropping off of it and losing their lives. And I went in and told Mama, she said, honey, you went to sleep. I said, Mama, I was not asleep. I said, I was sitting there, I had a funny feeling, Mama. I said, oh, I'm scared, Mama. What's the matter with me? She said, oh, you're just nervous, honey. I said, Mama, something, I don't want to feel this way. And it was something moving. And just, she wrote it down, and 22 years from that time, the municipal bridge which spans the Ohio River went across at the same place, and the same amount of men dropped off the bridge and lost their lives. Just exactly. From that, he would take... Some of these days I want to set out a tape recording and tell it in detail, which would take hours and hours and hours to go into the things when a little boy that I'd see things. I've seen the 37 flood coming. I remember I stood right on Falls City Transfer Company. Many of you all acquainted with Jeffersonville knows where that's at. I stood there and was preaching. I'd become a minister then. Many other things happened along the line of course, numerous. I would tell me to watch at a certain place. Do a certain thing. One time my papa was trying to get me to take a drink of whiskey. And I said, they call me a sissy. And I said, give me the bottle. I'll never be called a sissy. My daddy said, you, I raised a bunch of children, but one of them's a sissy, and that's Bill. I said, me a sissy? I said, I'm sick and tired of being called up. And I take the bottle and pull the stopper out of it and started to take it up to take a drink. I said, I'll show you where I'm at. The man said, do you mean to tell me you're a Branham or an Irishman? And won't take a drink? I said, give me the bottle, and I pulled a stopper to take the drink. When I started up, God Almighty in his grace stopped me from doing it right there, or I would have done it. I remember as a little lad then sitting in school, and I seen what whiskey had done to my home. I went to school with no shoes on, no shirt on all winter, my coat buttoned up like this. I was reading where Abraham Lincoln got off of the boat down in New Orleans and during the day of slavery and seeing him the great, big, burly uh, colored man. And his little wife and two kids screaming and crying and praying. And they was auctioning him off there to breed him amongst bigger women to bring forth a bigger, burnt, healthier, stouter slave. And that little mother standing there, and old Abraham Lincoln tucked his hat off his head. He just kissed and said, that's wrong. That man's a human and says, I'm a human. And someday I'll hit that with all I've got to get off my life. And he did. And not long ago in the Colosseum where that dress lays in his blood from his assassination, I was in that Colosseum, I seen an old darky, a little rim of hair around the back of his head, white as wool, walking on with his hat off like that stoop way over. He seen something jump back. I seen him bow his head and the tears running off his black cheeks. I seen he was saying a prayer, a praying. I stood near him till he got me praying. He raised up his head and said, Thank you, Lord. I touched him, I said, Uncle. Yes, sir, he said. I said, I, I'm a minister. I said, I was wondering why you were saying the prayer. What was the matter? He said, look over there. I couldn't see him but a dress. He said, on that dress lays the blood of Abraham Lincoln who took a slave belt off of me. He said, do you see why I'm excited? I said, yes, sir. I thought, oh, God, if the blood of Abraham Lincoln would have Try to slay that was took from slavery. What the blood of Jesus Christ to do to a born again man or woman? I said, drinking and so forth is wrong, and someday I'll hit death. I'm still on the battlefield. I'm putting every wage against it I can. Everything that I can, I know what it does to home. Look, all through life those things come and went. Finally, the calling of, to the ministry. Now, I want you to notice, 
Before I was a Christian confessing Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, that gift was there just the same. When I was a sinner, an alien, far from the commonwealth of God, that gift was there just the same, salvation just the same way. God, who is my judge that I stand before today, knows that's the truth. Was it I mirrored it? No, sir. And the Bible absolutely confirms and backs that up to be God's way of doing things. Gifts and callings are without repentance. Then, when someone told me about Jesus and his love for me, and how did I realize then that I was a sinner and an alien from God, I accepted him as my personal Savior. And then God led me around to some folks that taught me in the Scriptures, and I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then it began to come to me all the time. I consulted a clergyman. First, when I was ordained in the Missionary Baptist Church, you know what they said to me? Now, here, I want you to get this. How many love me? Put your hands up now. You're going to believe me. I hope you all do. I'm going to tell you something here that I don't tell people publicly. But I want you to know this. They, I talked to clergymen. I said, well, there's uh, uh, something that takes place in my life. I said, since I've been reading the Bible, would you think it would be something of God? I said, there's, I, I see visions and, and things that they tell and different things predicting that flood. When I stood there on the wall, I was, all, I was a Christian and a Baptist minister. I stood there, I said, now there's going to be, I've seen a vision, and there's going to be 22 feet of water over that street down there. I've seen some of the boys go along and said, Billy is trying to get a little bit off. He's getting too religious, you see. I tell my clergyman, my, the bishop, the pastor, so forth, they said, Billy, be careful what you're doing. The devil lays on that line. I said, ooh, my. Sir, the devil lays around there. Be careful. See, your mother tells me that you were born with a light over you. See, you might be possessed of a demon hanging near you. Ooh, my. Ooh. I said, well, uh, 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 sir, will you pray for me? Yes, we, we'll pray for you, Reverend Branham. Thank you, sir. You pray for me. I say, oh, God, oh, God, a devil near me. Keep it away, Lord. Don't let it get around me. No, I don't want to see no visions or nothing. I don't want to see nothing. I just want to study the Word here and pray and preach the Word. I don't want none of that stuff. No. Then the first thing you know, you hear it and move again. I couldn't help it. It comes so to me that I... And in 37, to tell you about, you see what happened. And friends, I could stand here until day after tomorrow at this time telling you things that happened right along down through life, and I'd take any person or any time at any place that anything that was spoke in the name of the Lord would have come to pass just exactly the way it said it would. I'd become a game warden here in Indiana. I'd been a group around him and everywhere else. I was a state deputy, wherever they called me. Then I, I, would, I was working. One day while coming in, I was trying to fight it away. I just I lost my first wife and been married. Then I was single for five years. Then my little boy was going to school. And what caused me to ever think of getting married again? She made me promise when she was dying that I wouldn't live single. Then one day I went over to the house to pick up my little boy. He was playing in the sand pile about five years old. Little Billy that you see around here. I said, Billy, come go home with me. I was living on a boat on the river, camping. I couldn't stay home. And home wasn't home to me no more. Down with my mother. Dad is gone, and, and with my mother-in-law, and oh, I just couldn't stay nowhere. And some people kept Billy, and I went over and explained his little stand by, and I said, Billy, you want to go home with Daddy? He turned and looked at me, his little eyes, he said, Daddy, where is my home? He had no home to go to. I didn't answer him. I choked up. I turned and walked away. I looked back at the little fellow. Oh, oh, God, someday if I pour him to a gallus or an electric chair, you turn and say, Dad, if you'd done what Mother told you to do and made me a home and raised me right, instead of me being pulled about from pillar to post, it wouldn't have been this way. Then I begin to think that maybe in her death hour or the hour of her going to this world, maybe she was right. I was married again. 
a lovely Christian woman filled with the Holy Ghost, which is my wife today, a lovely person. Then, one day while we was living in a little old shack, a little shanty, poor Brother Ryan gave me the bicycle. <laughs> I never will forget that. It's about taking up offerings. <laughs> I never took an offering in my life. They take an offering for me, but one day I remember over at church, I said, I'm going to take an offering. I just, me, he told me, he said, Bill, this, this, here we got to pay this, we got to pay this, we got to pay this over here, and this down here, and that there. So what are we going to do? And I was making my 27 a week, and I said, now 27 a week, and I pulled out my tidings, I laid that down, and I said, oh, oh my. I said, honey, I, I just can't even start to pay it. I said, well, we liked about $10, $12. And I said, well, Mom, what, what are we going to do? I said, you know what? I'm going to take up an offering tonight. She said, I'm going over to watch you. <laughs> I never took up an offering. Now, the people love me. I had a lovely big church, and you know that. They had done anything for me, but I was able to work. Why not work? So I didn't want I paid for the church myself. Worked and paid for it. Put it up there for the community. I love God. It's him the one that my love goes to. So I remember that night she went over and we all all sitting around there. And I said, all right, now tonight, friends, I hate to ask you this. I see her look up at me and I try to keep my head turned from her. I said, you know, it's just one of these times I never did this before. If, you know, can't probably make ends meet, you know how it gets. I said, you all got a nickel or a dime. I said, you'd like to drop in my hat over here. I said, Brother Wiseheart, would you come and take my hat? So Brother Wiseheart didn't know what to do. He come over at my hat, and I looked down. His little old mother sitting there, reached down under this little apron, you know, little checkered apron, pulled out this little pocket book, had a snap on the top of it, and began to reach down and get it. Oh, man. I couldn't take that. I, 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 oh, I thought, a poor old woman sitting there with that money reaching them nickels in there. Uh-uh. I don't want that. I said, I was just teasing you all to see what I can do. <laughs> and Brother Wise heard I already had my hat, you know. He said, Brother Graham, what am I to do? I said, just put my hat back. I was just going on, Brother Wise Heart, and I see my wife duck her head and kind of laugh. Brother Ryan gave me an old bicycle. He had been down there, and I and left it, gave me an old bicycle, and I painted it up and sold it for $10 and didn't have to take an offering after all. <laughs> That was the same bicycle I was on when that infidel met me on the corner and said what he did, live next door to me. I'm packing his pocketbook here today, and how God worked there. Oh, it's wonderful to see him in his power. Then, I, one day coming home, I was, I've been studying. Many of the ministers have been telling me not to listen to such stuff as that. I'll have to hurry. It just got about 27 minutes now, and I hurry as quick as I can because I want to get in an African experience. And this brother sitting here from Africa could get a hold of now. And now, I remember this, that I said, I wasn't going to have no more to do with it. And one day, I was going up the road to patrol up the Henryville State Fire Street, and I got on the bus. And now, listen, every one of you closely, the strange thing it was, that every time I met a demon-possessed person like a fortune teller or something, they'd speak to me, seemed to know me. Man, that would scare me to death. I remember going out one night at a carnival. I was just about 18 years old. My cousin, a couple of them and I were going down. There's a little gypsy fortune teller tent sitting there, and I was going down along the side there, and a the little, little gypsy woman said, Say, you come here. Well, all three of us turned around. She said, You with the striped sweater on. I said, Me? And yes, I thought maybe she wanted me to get her a coat. And I said, Yes, ma'am. She said, Do you know that you were born under a sign? I said, Look, woman. Shut up. <laughs> I got away from there right quick. Then, oh, they began to tease me, go on. And one day while I was warding, I was going up on the bus, and I was standing there, and I always a subject to spirit. I felt a strange feeling. I looked around, a big, strong woman sitting there, well-dressed. She looked up at me and said, how did you do? And I said, good evening. Looked up like that, and she said, um, uh, you're lonesome, aren't you? And I said, oh, ma'am? She said, well, you're not at your home. That's as much home as I got. She said, you were born for the West. I said, say, what are you talking about? She said, maybe I better explain myself. I said, are you an officer? I said, conservation. And she said, um, maybe I better explain myself. She said, I'm an astrologer. Oh, another one of them funny people. So then, 
I said, yes, ma'am. And I just kept looking on, moved up a little towards you. There's a sailor standing right behind me like that. The bus was loaded pretty well. And I thought it was just a woman wanting to talk. And she said, I'd like to talk to you a few minutes. And I never act like I heard her. I just kept looking on, you know. And so she said, um, can I speak to you just a moment? And I thought, that's not gentleman right, but I, I don't want to talk to her, see. And I was there and she said, um, say, uh, you the uh, conservation officer, say, can I speak to you just a minute? I said, what did you want? She said, can I speak to you just a moment? I said, what do you want? And she said, uh, and I thought that was a nasty way to ask as a man. So, just so indifferent, you know. And she said, um, are you a Christian? And I said, no, what's up to you? See? And she said, uh, she said well, um, I just wondered. And she said, did you know you were born under a sign? Oh, I said, look, lady, I don't want to know nothing about that, see? I said, not giving you any short answer. I've got a mother at home, see? And I said, I don't want to know nothing about that. She said, oh, don't be so hard. And I said, well, I don't want to know nothing about that stuff, see? I said, I know nothing about it. I know nothing about any religious things, and I, I don't want to know anything about it. And I said, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I just kept looking on ahead. She said, ma. And she said, you shouldn't act like that. And I said, well, I don't mean not to be a gentleman, but I, I, she said, listen, this is nothing to do with religion. She said, I'm on my road to Chicago. He's on a Greyhound bus. She said, I'm going to see my son, which is a Baptist minister. She said, I work in the White House. And she said, did you know the first thing? Did you know this in the United States and all the astronomy and how they do? I said, I know nothing about it. She said, well, I work in the White House. And she said, why did you go in the steps of the White House? Is this son of a said, there's a sailor standing behind you. Ask him if the moon doesn't does control the tides. I said, I got sense enough to know that. See? And she said, well, that's right. Said, in your birth, I said, said, perhaps I'll tell you just exactly when you was born. Would you believe me? And I said, you can't do it in the first place. See? She said, oh, yes, I can. I said, let's hear you. She said, you're born on April the 6th at 5 o'clock in the morning in 1909. I said, that's right. And I said, tell the sailor when he was born. She said, I couldn't do it. Well, I said, why can't you tell him if you, te- you could tell me? She said, because you were born under a sign. I don't know when that was to appear. She said, has the ministers never talked to you? I said, I have nothing to do with preachers. I said, I don't have nothing at all to do with them at all. I'd always run from it. You know, I, thinking of that speaking to me, and I know that's the same thing. My mama told me them things was of the devil, and I stayed away from it, see. And I said, no, sir, I have nothing to do with it. And she said, well, nobody ever told you that? She said, isn't it strange that preachers wouldn't know that? I said, I don't fool around where they're at. And I said, I, I thank you very much. She said, well, look, you were born under a sign, I want to tell you this, as a gift. And she said, if you only could recognize it. I said, yes, ma'am. I said, maybe I'll be a Daniel Boone. I like to hunt, and I was born in Kentucky. <laughs> and so she said, and um, like that, she said, um, no, she said, she she called me down. She said, no, that ain't what I'm talking about. I said, well, maybe I'll be a businessman. I've got a grammar school education. She said, that's not what I'm talking about. I don't know what you'd be. But I know that according to astronomy, and on that time, they was, uh, she tried to tell me about the pricing of the cycles and in commemoration of the Son of God when three stars came to us. She said, three wise men, the Magi, were following three different stars. They didn't know when they were coming. Said when they gathered together to met each other at the Bethlehem Gate, following three different stars, and they formed the one morning star that hung over the Christ. And she said one was from the lineage of Ham, Sham, and Jephthah, the three sons of Noah. They said those three stars went together and made the one star that hung over Christ. And said then when they separated, they never went to their orbits. They've never been sent. And said now all the stargazers in the country never seen such as that, and they never noticed it. Is this supernaturally given and on talking like that with all of her stuff? Well, I couldn't understand what she's talking about. And she said, in commemoration of that greatest gift that God ever gave the earth, he sends back uh, a, a something lesser in commemoration of that time. Well, I said, lady, I am not a Christian. I have nothing to do with preachers. I have nothing to do with what you I don't know nothing about the stars. All I know that I'm the game warden of Indiana. I'm doing the best that I can. Thank you. And went on like that. Well, that's just about the attitude. But strange that that... Then I got, after my conversions and so forth and on down, later on down in life, after my conversion got started, then it kept getting worse and worse, and it got so bad on me, I'd pray and tell God, take the thing away, I don't want to see it no more than ever. God, I'm a Christian now, I belong to you, please don't let that thing happen to me again. Don't show me nothing like that, Lord, just let me go like I am now, please let me just study the Word like I'm taught to do here, and study the Word, but it would continue to come. And one day, I come home to take off my uh, 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 coat was going around the side of the house, 
There's a man sitting out in front waiting for me, my kind of player from the tabernacle of Jeffersonville, her brother. He said, I'm going up to Madison this afternoon. Billy, would you like to go with me? I said, no. Can't go. I got a patrol. And I said, I can't go. I was patrolling on the high lines then. And he said, I can't go. And I started around the house. And as I started around the house, it seemed like the whole top of them trees, right there, Brother Ryan, where you and I have knelt to pray, come down like that. And I almost fainted. I fell back on the steps. And I stopped there. And I thought, hmm. My wife ran out. She had some water. She said, are you fainting, honey? I said, no. It was just a moment. After all, he, what, he come running in, Mr. Gibbs, and he went on back again, went on back to his place. I said, go ahead, I'm all right. So she said, what happened? Did you get sick? I said, no, honey, it's that same thing again. I said, look, I've got $17 laying in there. I'm going to have a showdown with God. I'm tired of this. I've got a place where I'm going up here, Greens Mill, where many of you know where my hiding place where the FBI couldn't find me. Back in the cave or go, I go there when things get bad and I settle it with God in there. I went back up into a place there, to a little cabin where I used to stay, where I used to fish and hunt and trap back there. I said, maybe I don't know when I'll return home. I can't tell you, I may be home in a, a two hours. I may be home in three days. I may not be home for two weeks or two months. I don't know when I'm coming home, but I'm tired of this. I can't live a prisoner. I said, everybody tell me I'm going, I'm a devil and so forth like that, but that and me trying to live a Christian life, and in my heart I love, love the Lord Jesus, expect to go home to heaven, and I don't want to be plagued like this. I went back up there, went into a place, I read the Bible, I cried, no light in so I had to close up the Word, and go back, and I started praying, I said, God, please, I'm a Christian, I love you, you know I love you, you know in my heart, you know me better than I know myself. I love you, and I'm told by the clergyman and so forth that the devil is spirit moving around me, and Lord, I don't want to have that around me. You know I don't. You know I love you, and I believe you with all my heart. So why do you let my life be plagued like this? Why would you do it? Why don't you set me free of that so I can go and preach and feel free of that? And all like that, and I was begging to him. I was wrong about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd prayed and cried and begging, and I stood there a little bit, and I stand, looked out a window. Went back. I thought, well, it won't be long until daylight. I right, when the daylight comes, I said, I'm going to leave the cabin and go up and knob up there and get back in my cave. And I'll stay there. Buddy Robinson said till he finds a pile of bones when he returns or something had to happen. I stayed there and I prayed. I walked back and for the first time in my life, it seemed like something I, I hear. Hear it now. Not by vision, but seemed like something tell me could those ministers be wrong? Maybe this is right. Well, I begin to think about maybe they are wrong. Well, I thought, well, then, if they could be wrong, how do these devils possess people, fortune tellers and things, telling me all about this, and them holy men of God don't know nothing about it? Well, then this come to my mind. When Jesus is born, it was stargazers. Magi that saw the star and followed it to Bethlehem. Is that right? No holy man saw it. Magi, stargazers, wise men. And them, in the, them on the towers, the astronomers that watches the stars all the time, they never seen the star. But the Bible said there was a star there. It was given for the Magi to see. Is that right? It had already appeared while I was baptizing down here, right at the end of Indiana. The other end of Indiana, there were thousands of standing on the bank when I was standing there baptizing. I started to say, Father, as I baptize this boy with water for the remission of his sins, then, Lord Jesus, you give him the Holy Spirit, the 17th person. I started to baptize a voice screamed from heaven in a bright afternoon, coming, whirling down out of the sky. Here come this light going, the paper's packed, mystic light appears over local Baptist pastor while baptizing, come right down and hung over where I was and stood there. People fainted and went on, then went right back up into the heavens and everyone of them standing looking at it. There it was, my first revival. I looked around, I didn't know. There it was. The businessman, the city, a group of them met me that afternoon and talked to me after I was baptized. I had to baptize 500 on my first revival. They said, what does that mean? I said, I don't know. 
I said, I am a believer. I don't know what it might have been to you, the unbeliever. I can't tell you. But while I'm in that room, I begin to wonder, look, all those men, nobody could say that priest wasn't a holy man in the days of Jesus. Is that right? They were holy men, good men, righteous men, scholars of the Scripture. But while they were in there arguing what kind of buttons on the table in their coats, the Magi's was coming to worship the Christ that had already been born. Is that right? Look, and when his public ministry come, now listen, when his public ministry come, they said he is a devil, the Elzebub, the chief of the fortune tellers, the best de- medium there is. He knows their thoughts and he knows all these things. He is a devil. Is that right? Who says that's the scripture say amen? But the strange thing was the devil turned around and said, No, he's not. He's the Son of God. Hallelujah. All of us, the devil testify. His enemies. But he's the Son of God. That devil said, I know who you are, you Holy One of Israel. I know who you are, thou art the Holy One of Israel. And the preacher, some holy man, said, He's the devil. He's the devil. The devil said, He's the Holy One of Israel. I've seen it. I see when Paul and Barnabas went up there to preach one time, the preacher said, them guys are imposters. They're devils. They're wrong people. Don't listen to them. They turn the wall upside down. They're wrong. And a little old fortune teller followed them down the street saying, they are man of God, the pedestal of life. Preachers saying they are devils, and the devil saying they're telling the way of life. Hallelujah. Don't think I'm excited. But I've got to a place where you can't listen to nobody. You've got to listen to God. Let every man's word be a lie. I know more about that now than I ever know in my life. Now you'll notice what people say. It's what God says. If it compares with the word, then it's so. If the goods is there to produce it, because God testifies of his gifts. You listen to a preacher, sometimes you get yourself in trouble. Some of them, anyhow. Notice. There they was, all muddled up in their doctrine. And devils, I hear fortune tellers, was the only ones, I'm not the only ones, but ones that was recognizing him to be what he was. And recognizing the apostles to be what they were, man of God, fortune tellers and devils. So Paul turned around and rebuked that spirit of deviation away from the woman. She couldn't tell him more fortune. He didn't need the devil to testify who he was. He knew who he was. God's saint. He didn't need the devil's help, but the devil was telling the truth about him anyhow. Jesus told that devil, said, hold your peace, but come out of him. Yes, sir. He didn't need the devil's help, but the devil was screaming. So many people talk about, one of these days before I leave, I'm going to preach to you demonology and let you know what demons are. You don't realize how they come right face to face with God and plead to come down and do something about it. Now, that's scriptural, besides knowing otherwise. How right you're in a meeting at night when one comes to the platform with an ounce of pain. You'll hear another one out there screaming for help. One standing on the platform, maybe dying with a cancer. Another one sitting up there with a cancer. And this cancer, knowing that he's facing down here, if that woman will only believe what I'm telling and believe Jesus Christ, she'll be healed as sure as the world. Then to throw that woman's face off, that other demon screams down to her. And I catch between them and say, here you are, both of you believe. Oh, we're living in the day of Christ. The power and the resurrection of the Holy Ghost. People, it's time to quit playing church. This form and ritualistic ideas is all right. They all come and you'll see that I've told you the truth. That's right. Of course, it's hard now. I know it is. I speak in the name of the Lord. And I know what I speak of. God testifies the same that it's the truth. All right. Then and there, I thought, oh, then maybe I have been wrong. Maybe I have been wrong. I should have embraced it. I should have said something. Then I knelt on my knees and I said, God, if I have been wrong, and I've turned down something that I didn't understand, trying to listen to what preachers are telling me. Maybe if I've been wrong, then, Lord, I don't understand it according to the Bible. But if I've been wrong, you forgive me. And I raised up and I was crying. I sat down, looked around. I seen a light flash in the room, like that young fellow flashed that bulb, and I thought, 
Somebody must be coming. And here on the floor is a big light coming around right above us to this halo pillar of fire moving around and come walking through there came an angel of God. My imagination, he was there. I looked at him, talked to him, walked up with his arms folded, a big man, very kind looking, yet with enough, looked like if he just spoke the world would have bursted. said, I've been sent from the presence of Almighty God to tell you that you were born for this purpose, to pray for sick people. To go into parts of the world and you'll be praying for monarchs and great men and healings and so forth will take place. And these things will be in great congregations will gather and it will cause a revival that's going to sweep the land. I said, sir, I'm uneducated. Oh, they won't believe me. I said, they, he said, as the prophet Moses was given two signs for a vindication of his ministry, you know, the turning his hand to leprosy and then healing it and, and the stick to a snake and so forth. He said, so will you be given two signs. One of them, you'll put your hand on the person. Then it'll be given. Don't think nothing of your own. It'll be given to you. Then it'll come to pass after so long a time, if you'll be reverent, if you'll be reverent, then it'll be given to you to know the very secrets of their hearts and the things that's wrong with them. And many of you here know when that first one was the only thing that was operating and not the second. Is that right? But I prophesied it would be there. And I said, that's why I'm here. I said, that's why I'm here. I said, I, that's why I'm concerned about. I said, I come here, sir. I've been told that that was the devil. That I, 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 it was wrong. But just a few minutes ago, I seen it. Of course, that was his presence in the room that changed that, of course. And then it was, I said, I've been told that, that was wrong. And he referred to me the scripture of Jesus, knowing where Nathaniel was. And the woman at the well, and Jesus claiming that a little while in the world seemed no more, yet he'd be with us, even in us, to the end of the world. And this light and so forth was his vindication and so forth. Then I said, I'll go, and he blessed me and returned back. He never told me to heal the sick. He said, pray for the sick. <laughs> But he told me, be told, tell them the secrets of their hearts, and the people might believe. See, not nothing. Now, that's a divine gift. Then from that it started, and you know the rest of it, how it goes. Now to Africa, quickly. Now, when I was standing in with Brother Bosworth on a platform one night in Houston, Texas, where thousands of other Raymond Ritchie come in here the other night and looked around and said, say, hey, don't look much like your meeting, all these empty seats. I said, but Brother Ritchie, God sent me to Hammond. But Billy, I'm with you by all my heart. I said, all right, pray for me, Brother Richie. I said, I'll talk to you, but it's just a few. He said, I understand. It's standing in the hall. He went away. That night down there, one of the very clergy gentlemen stepped up and put in the paper that I was an imposter and ought to be run out of the city and posing myself to be a Christian or a man of God and said, I ought to be run out of the city and all so like that. And he would challenge me to an open debate that I couldn't prove in the scripture. Out of the miracles of Christ, that even Lazarus, he died again. So he challenged that. Brother Bosworth comes and said, Looky here, Brother Brandon. I said, That doesn't bother me, Brother Bosworth. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never bother me. He said, But Brother Brandon, Brother Bosworth, 70 something years old, a lot of fire and fire in He said, That's wrong. And that has to be taken up. I said, we don't argue with people. There's thousands down there to be prayed for, a big coliseum sitting full of people. I said, my goodness, what's the use of arguing with one critic out there? Let him alone while the rest of them are getting healed. Let him go on. Jesus said, let him go. The blind lead the blind. They all fall in the ditch. I tell you, I ain't criticizing Baptists, but Baptist people fundamentally know what they're talking about as long as it comes to the Word, but they know nothing about the supernatural. And my brother, therefore, you're losing the blessing. You're right in your word. I believe you. I agree with you. In the things that you believe positionally in Christ, that the believer takes his place in Christ by faith, and he becomes a child of God by the grace of God. I believe that. And I agree with you. But you've done shut too much to this side. Isaiah said there'll be a highway and a way, and it's a conjunction, and a way. It will be called the highway of holiness. It'll be called the way of holiness. Right in the middle of the road, on this side rushes this. Some people, when they get born again, they're set right in the middle of the road. 
eyes on Christ. Finally, you get over here so much knowledge and wisdom, oh, they know it all, you don't know nothing. If you don't do that, you run off the other side to a bunch of wild fire fanaticism. That's right. But right in the middle of the way goes a true, sound, unadulterated gospel and power of God. That's right. Right down through there where you can take it to the kings and Mars, where anybody can stand and search and look and see that it's the power of Almighty God, not a fanaticism or not a formality. It's the power of God. And so there, in that Brother Bosworth said, let me discuss it with him. Second day, come out, say, I ought to be running out of the city, and he ought to be the guy to do it. Well, that, that just, to me, if you'll excuse the expression, that showed me the man hadn't been to Calvary yet. You never take a Christian, a Christian, you don't take that attitude. When you're born again, you love your brother. That's right. Well, by the fruits, you know them, so I just went on. But about where still he couldn't, he couldn't be satisfied. He said, let me have it. I said, not to fuss. He said, Brother Branham, I won't fuss. But it's a, we owe it to the society of this city that they put this in the paper and let them think that we're a bunch of nitwits and don't know what we're talking about. Let me challenge it. I thought, that's pretty spunky, like old Caleb of old. Let me go take that city. See? I kind of admired the old brother. I looked back to him and I said, all right, Brother Bosworth, if you promise me, you won't fuss. Now, he's sitting here listening at me. And he said, I won't fuss. I'll just give him the gospel. I said, all right. So the next day, uh, we got the reporters. wouldn't let him around the place where I was at the Rides Hotel. They wouldn't let him to the room. So then they wonder what I was going to say about it. But then... The next day, of course, headlines in the Houston Chronicle and all across, ecclesiastical fairs go to fly. You know, the, how the paper has to talk anything up. Oh, how this challenge and a debate was going to be held with young Dr. Best and what all he was going to do and all like that. So he come down to, he said, I'm going, he went and hired some commercial photographers of the American Photographer Association and said, go down and take six glasses of me while I go down and skin that old man. I'm going to skin him and rub salt on his hide and tack it up on my door for a memorial to divine healing. You imagine a Christian talking like that? I can't imagine a man born again talking like that. I tell you that. That's what he's going to do. So, Mr. Kipperman, which is an a Orthodox Jew, Mr. Iris, a Roman Catholic, the two boys that work in the studios, they come down and Mr. Iris had said everything about me. A guard had left a woman's stroke standing there before. He said he hypnotized her. And oh my, how he criticized me in the paper the day before. So it come down that night. They all gathered in there, thousands of them gathered. And that's when I realized what friends meant. They come from the east and the west, flew in by special planes, trains, and everything to come into the rescue. It didn't make any difference then whether you was a church of God assembly or who you was. The truth was his faith. Brother, well, one day when a persecution comes, you'll see the great ransom church of God stick together like that, stone over to stone. You'll forget whether you're a Methodist or Baptist or whoever you are. When the persecution rises and communism shuts down, the church of God will run together stone by stone. Like Solomon cutting the temple, one stone was cut this way and one cut that way and all this way, but when they went to putting her together, she went place them together like that and made the church of the living God. Your little differences will be all forgotten then. There was one thing that all the full gospel people believed in divine healing. They flew for as many as five and six hundred miles that day by planes and trains to get in. What was it? The thing that they believed in was a stake. And their friend here that they believed in was standing there to face it. There it was. They wanted to come see it through. Sticking with you, that's the way to do it. Hallelujah, I'm a real Kentuckian. Together we stand, divided we fall. The world Christians of every one time we ought to stick together is now. That's now. Then, when that night comes, my wife said, Now, honey, you shouldn't go down there tonight. That anointing is on you. And don't go down there because you'll just pollute the meetings for the night before. I said, Somehow I feel like I ought to go down. My brother was just taking me in and out like my boy does now. And a couple of more men, they said, Brother Branham, I don't believe I'd go down. They said, they're bound to fuss. I know how those fellows are. So they'll fuss and carry on. Well, they, I said, I just feel like I ought to go. I'll go way up in the balcony and pull my coat up over my ears and sit up there. I said, I want to go down. So I went down. They take me in, went up there, my coat all pulled up and sat down. Brother Bosworth got up there like an old patriarch, challenged, receiving that challenge from Mr. Best about 30 just out of the cemetery. Mm. So... I said cemetery, that's right. And so then a seminary, if you wish to call it that. Anyhow, 
Well, Bosworth got up there and said, I have, I forget how many different scriptures written here, Mr. Best, of Christ's present attitude in the New Testament towards the sick and afflicted. If you can take the Testament or the Bible anywhere and disprove any one of them, I'll walk off the platform like a gentleman. He's afraid to take the paper up. Brother Bosworth was astonished at him. He said, I'll ask you one question. You answer me yes or no, and it'll settle the thing forever. All right. He said, was the redemptive names of Jehovah applied to Jesus, yes or no? That settled it. <laughs> if he's Jehovah Jireh, he's also Jehovah Rapha. All right, if he is the God-provided sacrifice, if he isn't Jehovah Jireh, then he is not the Savior. He isn't the provided sacrifice. That settled it all together. Best jumped up and down and screamed and stomped and carried on and snorted and got angry and smacked the preacher and so forth like that. Preached a good Camelite sermon there and never said, talk about when... You know where he applied divine healing? First Corinthians 15, when this mortal puts on immortality. Well, the Bible said, I believe that too, sir. <laughs> but I'm talking about divine healing now in the atonement. And he got all puffed up and said, bring that divine healer on. Brother Bosworth said, ridiculous. Said, Brother Bram don't claim to be a divine healer. He only claims to, uh, to be able to help the people by praying for them. Said, uh, the, pre preaching divine healing don't make him no more divine healer. Preaching salvation makes you a divine savior. So he went on. And after a while, he kept on, Brother Bosworth said, I know Brother Branham's in the meeting. I was setting twice the distance of this building. Way back up. But I know he's here. And if he wants to come and dismiss the audience alone, let him come do it. But he is not necessary. People get to look around. I was sitting there like that, listening to Brother Bosworth and admiring him. But just as he said that, I felt the Holy Spirit move down. Oh, that same wind that come. <sighs> I looked around to my wife, looked back to my brother. He said, sit still, Bill. I tell it again. Whoosh. Something moving. You can call me a fanatic if you want to. Go ahead and you'll settle it at the judgment bar. It's gone. I felt something moving. I raised up. Howard said, Bill, sit down. I said, leave me alone, Howard, in the name of the Lord. He's near. About that time, people getting screaming, thousands of them down there. Ushers formed a big line. I went walking to the platform. I said, I do not claim to be a divine healer, and I'm sorry that Mr. Besson, none of you think the bad of him. His mother loves him as well as my mother loves me. And that's all right. That's what we're Americans for, and that's what they're dying on the battlefront for. And so we can have our rights and so forth. That's all right. I said, I disagree with him in the Scripture. He said, as a man, he said, as a man, I admire you. But in Scripture, I disagree. I said, that's a mutual feeling. Went right on. So then we, he said, all right. He said, now look, he walked over there. Then after the little rally come up where about hitting the preacher. So then I said, it's a shame that people would try to debate such things. When right there, I said, one thing Mr. Best says that I'd like to say. He said he felt sorry for these people sitting around here with cancer and so forth. He felt sorry for him. I said, I don't believe that's the truth. I don't believe he sincerely mean that. Because right back there in that audience, that's people that a few nights ago were sitting here sick and afflicted with cancer and blindness like these people are, and there they are well, and he's trying to deprive these people of the only hope they have of living. And then saying he's sincere and feels sorry for him, I don't believe it. He said, oh, Baptists don't believe such things as that. He said, only you bunch of quack pods believe such stuff as that. He said, a Baptist don't believe in divine healing. Brother Bowser said, I beg your pardon, just a moment. He said, how many of you here in this church, in this building tonight? There sat a whole slew of Baptist ministers sitting there, which Brother Richie just called him and said, Which one of you set him here? The Baptist church better watch then. There's thousands and thousands of members sitting there. See? So he said, None of them sent him. He sent himself. The Baptist conference was going to be responsible for sending him. It was him himself. All right. Brother Bosworth said, How many Baptists in here that goes to good Baptist church and has good fellowship can say that that they have been healed since Brother Graham has been your body by healing. Stand up and hundreds of them stood to their feet. But what about that? <laughs> you know what Brother Graham said? He said, anybody could testify to anything, I wouldn't believe it anyhow. And walked away. Oh, my. Hallelujah. Watch. Then I stood there and I said, I do not claim to be a healer. When I was born, they told me that an angel of God come near me. Here, a few, two or three years ago, yonder, 
standing in a place, he commissioned me to go pray for the sick people and so forth, which I'm to do to pray. And I said, I've got a letter right here now and a cablegram from King George of England who's suffering multiple cirrhosis, who was that man healed here in Fort Wayne, which was a friend to his private secretary. And he sent two cablegrams ready for me to come pray for him. Over there, and I said, uh, King George of England, the highest king, the biggest, greatest king on earth today. And I said, and God told me that angel was sent from him, said I'd be praying for kings and great men and so forth, like doctors and so forth that's been healed right now in the meeting. And I said, I claim that I do not know nothing about their healing, only as I see God shows me by his spirit. And if I tell the truth, God will testify of the truth. If I am a liar, God will have nothing to do with me. I said, if I'm a liar, God will never back up a lie. God's all truth. Is that right? Yeah. I said, if it's a lie, then God will have nothing to do with it. I said, if I speak the truth, my heavenly Father will speak of me in about that time here he comes. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah! Here he comes dropping down in the building right over where I was at. Kipperman standing there, snapped the picture. The one have taken the six pictures of Mr. Best. I said, he has spoken. That's all necessary. I walked away. Even Catholic people sitting there watched and seen that vision and said, What was that old that man had come give their hearts? And I want to serve Jesus Christ. From this old man looking in the audience, hush. I walked on out. Mr. Kipperman went in. He said, Well, what do you think about that, Ted? Or Iris? And Iris said, I don't know. It's got me beat. They went on in and started developing the pictures. I, Kipperman, the Jew, went upstairs to go to bed. And when he did, his, his father lived over the studio. Iris was going to, the Catholic boy was going to try to develop the pictures. And when he got it, he put them all through, developed them, smoked a cigarette, pulled one of them out. It was blank. The one he's going to take a Mr. Bosworth when he was skinning him. It was blank. The next one blank. The next one blank. And all six of them was blank. Not one of them showed. God let him know who was boss. Then he pulled the next one out. And to his surprise, there was the angel of the Lord standing in a flaming fire over where I was standing. He grabbed his heart. He looked back. He dropped an agony. He screamed for Ted. He ran down the and said, Look at there, look at there. Look at there. It's something in. It's the truth, Ted. But maybe I've been wrong. There, that night, even yet at 11 o'clock, that negative went to Washington, D.C. by plane to be copyrighted. Brought back at George J. Lacey, the best there is in the United States on research, was brought from California to Houston, Texas, for, to take the negative under consideration. He kept it for days. He looked at the lights. He looked at the camera. He took everything and before he could sign because he's an FBI agent. See, the best they got before he could put his name in anything. He went down and then at the day when he was going to call out, he said, when he come out, come out in the room. He said, oh, I'm fellow sir. He said, whose name is William Branham? I said, mine, sir. He said, stand up. I stood up, red-headed man, with a heart boiled first. He said, Reverend Branham, he said, I was, had a good Christian mother. I was taught to believe. He said, but you're going to pass out of this life like all mortals. I said, yes, sir. I know that. But thank God I'm ready. He said, but as long as there's a Christian civilization, he said, I've criticized your meeting. I've said myself it was psychology. But said, Reverend Brandon, the mechanical eye of that camera will not take psychology. He said, the light struck the negative. He said, I'm ready to sign my name to a document. That it was there. Then you see all these supernatural beams ever photographed in all the world's history. People begin weeping and crying. There it is. We got permission to put it in the book back there. And there we stand today with it. Day after that, Brother Bosworth comes show me a skeleton picture. Said, Brother Branham, Florence Nightingale's calling from Durban, South Africa. Come pray for her. Said she's the great, great granddaughter of something to late Florence Nightingale of all the, I thought there's another one of those renowns. But I said, Brother Bosworth and all these things going on, I can't, I'm fixing to close in a minute. I said, I want you to get the last of this now so that you'll know. And you'll hear me speak something just in a minute. I want you to mark it down. I said, Brother Bosworth, I can't go the way things are now. I can't do it. 
I said, let's pray. We knelt down on the floor, he and I, and my little girl, and my wife, and we knelt in the floor and prayed. And I said, God, if you'll heal this Miss Nightingale, then that'll be a sign for me to go to Africa, because I've always wanted to go down there to that, them people and take this to them. And I said, if you'll heal her, I forgot about it. Weeks past, six or eight weeks, the woman had to be held up. You see her picture in a voice of healing. We got it here. Just, there it is back there in the book also, just a skeleton standing. Well, it was, she couldn't eat. She had a, a cancer on the bottom of the stomach like that, a duodenum of the stomach, and big malignant growth. And Carl, no one could go down. They give her glucose so her veins collapsed, and that was all. And there, her laying there in that condition, dying, praying for me to come. And I said, Lord, if you heal her. Weeks and weeks later, I landed in London, England. I was going to go down uh, to see if the King George of well, being in. So then, when I, I heard him page me, Brother Baxter went down there. You see, it was Florence Nightingale had found out some way, I don't know what I was coming to London, and she flew in just a little bit ahead of me. And when she flew in there, I went to, the, they wanted me to go out and see, and you couldn't even, she couldn't even get her out of the plane, hardly thought she was going to die. I had a minister take her to the house after I went out to Buckingham Palace, back to Westminster Abbey, and the next morning I went into London. I'll never forget this. Listen close now. You couldn't go home if you dismissed any house pouring down rain. So, you listen just a moment. Maybe it'll cool off for the night service. Thank God for it. Now, look, I went in. I'll never forget this experience. We, they come and got me from Piccadilly Hotel, and we went up into uh, this minister's place. And when I got up there, oh, if ever I seen a sad, sickly sight, I see it there. She couldn't move her hand. She's laying there, and she's trying to move her lips. Her nurse got down, two of them, and they said, Have Brother Branham to ask God to let me die. How could I ask God to let her die? And the nurse said, Brother Branham, said she prayed so hard, she's always believed if she could ever get where you were at, that God would heal her. Oh, when I think of that, I stood there. That was Brother Baxter, Brother Lindsay, Brother Moore, those Anglican ministers. All of them standing there, the nurses, a dying woman. She's trying to move her lips, something else, and some tears rolling down her cheeks, just bones. The nurse got down and said, she wants me to lift her hand up to you. And they lifted that skeleton hand. Put it in mine, just as hard as that bone. What a feeling. And she said something. The nurse guy said, she wants you to see her body. This is a mixed audience, but remember me like a doctor. They took the sheet from over. Oh, if your heart would sink. As the woman is in her bosom here, all sunk to, to her ribs, just ribs laying there, just a frame like some mummy. In her body down in here, her hip, even the, so thin and to the ring of the hip, the skin was sticking between, stuck together between there. No, I don't see how they can move the poor thing. Why she's living, I don't know. The thickest place about her was right here in the stomach part. Is this about like that? I never see her legs is about that big around. I said, can she move? Said no, she's perfectly helpless. Said she won't. She said she she wants to die, but she's tried to see. Said I, the nurse said I believe she'll die now right away, Brother Branham. Said because she's wanted to see you before she died. Oh my! I looked at the poor thing. I thought, oh I'm Jesus. I said, let's pray, brethren. All of them gathered together and knelt down around the bed and around praying. There's a little window like this. Now, if I can geographically get myself, the window's set that way, and it's awful foggy and dark in England. It's around in April. It's a kind of foggy day, and the window was up two story. It was up like this there. It's business. You know how England is. You just come from there. So I, I knelt down this way in position to the east would be from there. And all of them knelt, and I was the leading prayer. And I said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And about time I said that, something come flutter, 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 coming through the bushes like that, and a little turtle dove come sat on the window. And he began to walk back and forth, up and down, right above me, about that far, looking down, going, coo, coo, coo. Little restless fella walking up and down the windowsill, pacing. And I said, Almighty God, the creator of heavens and earth and the giver of all good gifts, I pray thee that thy blessings may rest upon this poor dying mortal and almighty God who separated me from my mother and fed me all the days of my life knows that in my heart I can't ask for her death when she's prayed so hard for her life. Oh God, you said the affectionate, fervent prayer of a righteous man 
Now, I know what a righteous man is not righteous in himself, but in trusting in the grace of Jesus Christ, I ask you to be merciful to her. Well, I said, God, no more can I do, but I commit her to you now. Oh, my Father, hear me in the name of your Son, Jesus. And I said, Amen. When I said, Amen, the little turtle dove just constantly walked real restless up and down there, and he flew away. And when he flew away, those ministers had done quick praying and was watching the dove. So when I raised up, they said, did you notice that dove? And I started to say, I, and when I did, something caught me. I said, thus saith the Lord, this woman will live and not die. Hallelujah. I could have been more than knowing what I was going to say, and I know what I'm going to say ten years today at the same time. But he spoke it. And from that hour, today she is in perfect health. 155 pounds as normal as any person could be. There you are, moving into Africa quickly. I stopped out the only place I know I was going to Durban. That's where she is from. I promised God I'd go. When I moved into Durban, Brother Bosworth, now this may scratch a little here, but truth is truth. I moved in, was having a wonderful meeting, and God had done so many marvelous works. I tell you, it was enough to alarm anything. Even two uh, Dutch Reform ministers, Brother Jackson, you're acquainted with what I'm going to say. Two Dutch Reform ministers was arguing. I'll have the shirt here. They're going to send it to me, Brother Schumer. It has arrived yet. Neither has the zebra skins or anything has arrived. But they sent this shirt in. This a Dutch Reform went over and told another, said, this is the day of our visitation. And you should hear it. The other Dutch Reform said he's nothing but a spiritualist. And the other one said, did you ever see a spiritualist heal the sick? No. He said, I'll go out and pray for your soul. One saying to the other, the one went back to the yard, knelt down and got under a peach tree and began to pray, God have mercy on his friend's soul. And when he did, he said, down before him came the angel of the Lord in the world. And then that moved back and an angel come and laid his hand on his shoulders and told him to return to his friend. And when he went back in, he said, what had happened? And here the next day come out, this minister turned around and looked, and there on the man's shirt was the starch print of the angel's hand laying on his shirt. Hallelujah! Headlines to the biggest paper in South Africa. That right, brother? Uh, the brother, sister, no one. Then there it is. I'll have it pretty soon. It's sent to me now to be translated over into English. There are the minister's eyes like this. And they took me down there and took my left hand and laid it on the left hand, just perfectly covered it exactly. When a man was standing there with a normal shirt and the minister looking at him, and a second from then, oh, not a second, I say three minutes from then, there he said something struck him like fire on his back, and there was the angel of God who he said was in a whirl, just exactly like had been explained, testifying. He was telling the man the truth. Signs and wonders of everything. Finally, he told me, he said, you're going down around Cape Town and down through that way and making a itinerary. I said, that's all right with me, Brother Baxter. We're having a wonderful time here. Thousands and thousands and thousands are coming. I said, why not stay here? I said, where is Durban? I thought Durban was in Rhodesia. My wife was riding me Durban, southern Rhodesia. And that's like right in Hammond, Canada. See? It's another nation. So I was, I said, where well, shall we go? I said, Brother Baxter said, well, they've got an itinerary set for you go way down through us. That's all right with me. It doesn't matter. Listen closely now, I'm going to close just in a moment. So that night, I remember when I went in to pray, the angel of the Lord come near me. He said, don't go down there. He said, don't you go. He said, you stay right here in Johannesburg for two more weeks. Then go over to your place for a rest to go hunting, which the man had already fixed up. Then said, you go to Durban and stay a month. Said, yes, Lord. Said, tomorrow they're going to pull you out to a doctor, but don't pronounce him well because he's not going to get well. And said, don't you do that. And said, your manager tomorrow is going to show you a peculiar bird of flying. Said, and then you're going to find a native bead salesman sitting on the side of the road with a skin place on the side of her head. That's just the way it happened <laughs> the next day, just word by word. I said, Brother Baxter, I'm not going down there. Well, the National Committee said, you've go got to go. I said, oh, no, I don't. No, no. I said, I only do what God tells me to do. And I said, I don't go where he tells me to go. Oh, but said, the, you think the Lord speaks to somebody else besides you, one of the committee men said? Now, now, my brothers, I'm not throwing off on preachers. You're godly men, and you're doing a lot for this meetings and so forth. There's godly preachers. But if you ever want to get in trouble, just get muddled up with a bunch of preachers. That's right. 
That's the reason I keep clear of them. That's right. Now, that's right. They said the Lord speaks to us as well as he speaks to you. I said, Cora had that same thought one day. That's right. I said, I know. He said, well, the Lord told us to make that itinerary. I said, maybe he did, but he told me not to take it. Now, you can decide for yourself, I'm not going. And I went on back in, and here done come the cars. Brother Baxter said, Brother Brand, you, you're going to have to make some kind of a move. I said, well, I'm not going. He said, well, I'd at least go to this one, then we can get it later. He said, they're already out here waiting. And I said, Brother Baxter, remember, in the name of the Lord I speak. It's not God's will. He said, well, Brother Bram, it's great. I said, I don't care what they say down there. God told me not to do it. And went on down there. I started in with Mr. Schoeman, the chairman. I said, Mr. Schoeman, look, God's telling me not to do this. You are deliberately taking possession and doing things that you shouldn't do. Remember, he said, Brother Branham, I'm just one of the committee. The committee says we've got to do it. We promised Brother so-and-so we'd bring you there. We promised Brother so Yeah, there you are. Uh-huh. And, oh, well, well, you promised Brother so-and-so. God told me not to do it. And I said, I- I'm not going. So he kept on, went a little farther, about 60 miles out of town, going to little Clarkstoff. Is that the name of the little Cl- Clarkstoff? Going down through there, was going on. I said, stop, Brother Schumann. Just stop. Let the rest of them catch up. And then here they all come up. Caught up. Brother Schumann walked back and said, you'll have to go talk to him. He's still determined he's not going to do it. Brother Baxter come over there and he said, Brother Branham? Brother Baxter's listening at me now. Said, Brother Branham? Said, I believe if they've got that committee already formed, you should go ahead. I said, Brother Baxter, listen to me. I go to show, and I'll show you the lesson of it. No matter if he's my manager, he's a good man, a religious man, a fine man, a Christian man, full of the Holy Ghost. But God is my guide. God was trying to get that to me. He said, Brother Bam, as he already said, here's what you're saying. You're saying you're going out to Jackson's farm to hunt like that. said, I wouldn't mention hunting. He said, that them brothers think millions of people laying down here suffering and you going hunting. I said, if I never see another gun, I never find another gun. It doesn't matter to me. God said so. He's seen that break between there. If he kept me under too long, I'd be like I was about three years ago, laid up for eight months. Couldn't stay too long. I said, God said so, and I must do it. So they argued and argued around there. I walked over there and got a hold of some, I guess it's wild locusts, is it? Uh, uh, is, is that what it kind of looks like, a locust, I guess? I pulled some branches off the trees, walked back out there where those ministers are standing, and threw it over their feet like that and said, Thus saith the Lord, if we go down even the clerk's stuff, you'll suffer the results. You got me here. I haven't even got money to pay my way back. You, you got me here, and I can't go back. Also, couldn't go back. He told me to go to hey, Johannesburg. You got me sold up here. I said, you'll see, as Paul said one day, you should have listened to me. See? I said, there, God's a blessing. There, even the medical association called me up the next morning, won't take me out to breakfast, said, Brother Branham, you've done more for the people here in South Africa and half the missionaries that come over here in 50 years already. The medical association. They dismiss the hospitals, and they come by the stretchers and everything else. Yes, sir, said, we believe divine healing the way you preach it. I said, sir, I'm not a fanatic. I only tell what's truth. He said, uh, we like your way of doing it. We believe it. That's right. I said, we're a Christian man, and we believe it, and we give you the right hand of fellowship. And there it was. You see the pictures, the books where the ambulances and the nurses just lined everywhere. Anybody want to come could come to the meeting. All right. Then it went on, and then we started on down when we got to Clark's off that night. Oh, my. It was a discredit to the place. There was a people lined up on the hills and everything else. Not enough room to take care of them in the city. No place to eat. No place to stay. And I stayed at a minister's house. And just about time they got ready to bring me to the meeting, you know what happened? A tropical storm hit that country, I'm telling you. And from about 7.30 till about 10.30, his one constant roar and flash and lightning. You ain't had no storm around here. You ought to see an African storm one time. <laughs> oh, my. Like to drown at everybody. We come back up to the building, where's that? And I stayed right in the house. After they're done dismissing, Brother Bosworth went over, got some people over in a little building of some sort, was praying for them, come back up. I walked in, I said, do you believe me? Well, that was just a storm, that could happen. I said, all right, let it be like that. And the next night, they like to pose to death. A blizzard swept through. Come back up there, and I said, now do you believe me? Tomorrow night we'll have an earthquake. Hmm? I said, we're out of the will of the Lord. 
I said, you just might as well. They got to arguing, well, we promised brother so-and-so. And now here, not to no discredit, F.F. F. Bosworth sitting there is one of the as good of friends and as close a brother to me as there is in this world. That old man has become a part of my heart, like me, he to be my daddy. But just that God trying to let me know that you can't touch you. And this kind of a spirit or gift or this kind of a gift, you've got to follow God. Brother Bosworth come to me and he's a witness standing there. He said, Brother Branham, I think you are wrong. He said, I believe if you'll go down that way around Cape Town, you'll see the exceedingly, the abundantly, the best you've ever seen in all your life. And there sits Brother Bosworth as a witness. I said, Brother Bosworth, as long as I've been with you, and you've seen those visions and seen how they come to pass, and I'll tell you now in the name of the Lord that it is not God's will for us to do that. We're to go to Durban, not down to Cape Town. And you mean to tell me, he said, well, he said something about one if it could have been a false vision. One of the, I said, well, Brother Bosworth, there to show my, 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 my second daddy, the man that I love, the very bosom. Now I looked and I said, oh, God, have mercy. 15,000 miles away from home, and there my manager and Brother Baxter and Brother Bosworth and everybody else. I said, God, what can I do? I walked back in there. I said, well, look, I'm trapped, but not in God. I tell you in the name of the Lord, I shall not take that, man, that way there. They said, is it? Well, they, somebody fell up. Could it be then a permissive will of God? Well, when something's named about the permissive, oh, well, I said, God might permit it, but it ain't his will. Well, when the permissive will, you know what happened, Brother Bosworth? Everybody, well, go in and ask him. Go in and see him. I walked in, and my poor little boy sitting here behind me. We were sleeping in the same room. Little Billy come in and put his arm around me. He said, Daddy, don't you listen to them preachers. You listen to what God's telling you, Daddy. I said, pray with me, Billy. We knelt down. Of course, he got tired. He don't know much about it, so he went to bed. I stayed there. Long towards 3 o'clock in the morning, I raised up. I felt it just like a man standing there. He moved around this side. I said, my Lord. I said, what are these men telling me out here? He said, go with them. Go on. But said, you'll pay for it. You're trapped, but you'll pay for it. Go on with them, and I'll give you the permission to go, but remember, you'll pay for it. And said, for that, go wake up your boy. He honored Billy. He said, go wake up your boy, because Billy had the truth. And he comes and said, go wake up your boy and tell him in the morning, it's going to be a pretty day. The storm things will clear away. And in the morning, it'll be a pretty day, and they'll want you to go pray for the sick at Sunday school. I'll bless it. He said, if Billy's going to come after you in a man, a young fellow, in a little black car, and he's going to pick up another boy on the road. On the road back, there's going to be a native, a colored man, we call it here, standing by a eucalyptus tree near a bridge, fixing to strike another. He's got a white sapphire suit on, fixing to strike another with a stick. Tell your boy that, and tell those men that, so they'll know that it's thus saith the law. I woke Billy up, and I said, Billy boy, God has honored you, son. And here's what shall come to pass. And I told him, I went into Brother Bosworth. Is that right, Brother Bosworth? If that's right, raise up your hand so the people can see. I walked into Brother Bosworth. I said, Brother Bosworth, Brother Baxter, all the rest of you, Brother Statsworth, all of you here, thus saith the Lord. God told me to go ahead with you, but it's his permissive will, and it will never be successfully. God wants me to go back to Johannesburg, then up to Brother Jackson. Then over to Durban for a month. Little did we know then that they had the segregation all through there. Didn't know it until we got to Durban. They didn't have the segregation at Durban. The only place in South Africa that didn't have the segregation where the natives could come in. Then, that's what we went for. And then when we got, we started off the next morning. It was a pretty morning. Got up. They went out, and sure enough, they sent back for me to come to Sunday school. I done preparing myself. Didn't eat and waiting for the Spirit of the Lord. And when Billy come in, he said, Daddy... I looked out there. I said, where'd you pick up that boy? He said, just as you said, standing down on the corner. We got out, got in the car. Billy is sitting in front. Nobody speaks to me while we're going under the anointing. No one talks. And then going down, Billy was tapping his, rubbing his hand across the back of my hand, laying there, patting my hand. He said, Daddy, look at there. And there, standing with a white sapphire suit on a native, standing near a eucalyptus tree by a bridge, fixing a strike another with a stick. I said, you remember what I told you this morning? The little fellow cried. I said, there it is, Billy. That's the right way to go, but we'll pay for it. And Brother Bosworth, as a witness of God, 
The very next meeting, hell broke loose. Is that right? Trouble set in. And it was that way till we got from the Durban. There Durban were nearly 100,000 people had gathered for the meeting and so forth. And there's where the 30,000 converts was in a day on the road around. I got a great brother Baxter got sick first. He really got sick. Billy got sick. All of them got sick. I, all, all of my bunch, Billy and I and brother Baxter, then I got sick and I really got sick. I mean, I was so sick I couldn't even get to the pulpit hardly. I'd stand just so weak, oh, so sick. My, and come to find out, I'd caught African amoeba. And then when they brought me home, I suffered. I suffered with it. When a little doctor lives this across Dr. Sanadere for me, I spoke to him about it. He said, Billy, that thing can kill you in 10 hours. That it gets in a bloodstream. If it goes to the liver, you die. Or if it goes to the liver, it'll burst. They can drain you. You live. If it goes to the heart or to the brain, it kills you. you it finishes in 10 hours. You take a real heavy fever and you're done. African amoeba. It's, a back, it's not a bacteria, it's a, it's a parasite, like little barnacles that gets into the intestinal tract and comes from the Indians, and they stick right in there and suck the blood or the mucus out of the uh, tracts until they bury themselves. There's no medicine can touch them on. They haven't got a treatment hardly. And then on and on and worse and worse and worse and worse I got and on and on and on and on. Now you wonder why I've been out of meetings for eight months. And Brother Bosworth, here's another thing. I speak this in the name of the Lord. When I stood at Shreveport, Louisiana, God knows I'm saying this. I said, Satan has a trap set for me. When I prophesied under the Spirit, there and I said, in Africa, there's something you all pray for me. Little did I know that it was among my brethren. But that was a trap. And then when we left there at Clark's off, I said, if I'm taking this, but we'll probably be out of meetings between six months and a year. You remember saying that, Brother Bosworth? Is that right? Seven months has passed. This is going in the eighth since the meeting. A dysentery. Couldn't hardly stand up. So sick. I'd pray, I'd pray, I'd walk the floor, I'd cry, I'd pray, I'd walk the floor, and I'd cry. And people would come there, come Hyman Appleman's friends and all them, they leaned across the table and said, Brother Bram, this ministry said that we've been to the schools, but we believe the teachers are wrong, said we want to know the supernatural. And here I was so sick and trembling myself that I couldn't hardly move. I went out to see Brother Bosworth. We knelt and had prayer and so forth, and nothing it looked like God had shut the heavens up. I walked back and forth across the floor to see if I could say, Now the next time you will listen. For months after months, and finally, Dr. Sam came over to where I was one night. We sat there talking. He said, I want you to pray for a certain fellow down here, Billy. That's got a, he's a erotic. He said, he's my office guard talking. He said, what about the Aniba house? Things get along. I said, oh, it's, I told him the symptoms of it. He said, oh, Billy, my boy. He said, you, there is and nothing can touch it now. It's gone. I said, oh, my, I said, God, have mercy, have mercy. I walked the floor, and one night, when I'm coming back across the seas, I said to Brother Bosworth, I said, he said, oh, Brother Brandy, put his arms around me. He said, I'm so proud of you, my boy. Brother Bosworth, I said, I have fought a good fight. Brother Bosworth, I'm 40 years old. I said, my, I guess she's all over now. I said, 40 years old. I said, I was your age before I got converted. Boy, you're just starting. Like that, and I was beginning to think, like catching on. And that night I was laying there on the bed, and I said, I slept in a room to myself with the little, my little girl, my little five-year-old girl, the wife of the next room. There'd been people there all day. Now, as I close, here's what's taking place. Write this down. Remember this. Keep it in your mind. As it was prophesied, Brother Upshaw and you all over in Finland when you seen the, the resurrection of the little boy and so forth. Note about that when it was told. I want you to put this down also. I was laying there one morning about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I was thinking, oh, what will be my future? What will be the outcome? And while I was laying there, I fell into a trance. And here come one walking to me. Oh, my. I looked at him. He walked straight to me, stern. He said, as thou was thinking of what would be your future, I said, yes. He grabbed up a piece of papers like that and folded them like typewriter paper like that, held it out like this, and he stood beside me like that and swirled them like that and went plumb up into the heavens, and he said, your future is clear. Now come out of it. So I said, oh, God, I wanted to talk to you so much. He never comes but one time, one at a time. I said, Lord, I was wanting to talk to you so much. If thy servant has found favor in your sight, will you return again, great Holy Spirit, to me again? And then I felt it coming. And so at that time, 
I seen him walk to me and said, you've been fearing about that anemia condition. I said, yes, will it ever leave me and bother me anymore? He said, never no more. That settled it. Then he come again. He said, you've been thinking on these things about how you should conduct your meeting. And them telling you about uh, other men who conducts their meeting said, you do just as I lead you to do. Whatever meeting, let it provide for itself. Then just then he take me out in the spirit. Listen, Brother Jackson, you never heard this. None of the rest has. And he set me down at Durban, South Africa. And that same booth thing there before those tens of thousands and thousands of people there. And I looked and I seen all that meeting gather together and fade off to my right. Geographically, I was standing this way. And it faded to the west, going this way, turning blue. And then right before me stood blocked off streets like that with people standing there with their hands up praising God. Then he turned me to the east and looked that way. And I seen people standing there with clouds like on, like the Indians wear. And there were thousands of them and they had their hands up in the air just to praising God and screaming and praising God. And I couldn't even see the end of them. And just about that time come a great angel from heaven and stood me over the top of me here with a big light. And that light like on the end of one of these uh, oscillating lights on the front of a, a big locomotive and began to throw in the hillsides were setting black and standing with people for a mile away nearly. And I said, oh, are the all black people? Then he turned my face here in front of me to Durban again, and there were beautiful white men and women standing with their hands up in the air praising God. Then he turned me back again. The great light started going way back over the hills and showing. Then the angel drew near, and I heard him scream with a voice and shook me from the vision and said, there will be 300,000 of them in that meeting. Thus saith the Lord. Mark it in your book. I come out of it. I said, My Lord and my God, thanks be to you. I appreciate the stripes and the whipping that you give me for disobeying you. But from this on, Lord, knowingly, if I ever know again, I'll never tie myself up with a bunch of nobody else, preachers, managers, or no one else, but what I'll be free to do what you say do. And I'll go just where you say go and do just what you say do the rest of my life. And I'll always try to do just as you say do. And about that time here he come again, and I seen my Bible rise off the table and come over to me like this. It was turned over to the place where Paul in the storm said he should have listened to me and not have loosened and creep. But nevertheless, the angel of the Lord who stood by me and so forth, and then he turned right back to Joshua, the first chapter. And a finger placed on there said, No man shall stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. And reading it right on down through the lines that come back, I said, Only be strong and very courageous. I come to myself. And I said, My God, my body was weak. I'd been under it for about three hours. Just then a little wee knock come at the door. It was my beloved wife coming with a baby on her arm. She said, Bill, something has happened. And I said, What's the matter? She said, at 3 o'clock this morning, the baby woke up, and I started to come here. Never before in our life, she said, and something stopped me there at the door before I come through the hall. and said, don't go in there. A vision's going on that cannot be interrupted. Oh, amazing grace. I said, yes, honey, and I told her, and I grabbed my Bible and wrote it all out on a file each, so I'd be sure to know it. Like that, and got it out like that. We went on out to breakfast, and here come my mother-in-law, a very staunch Christian. She said, what's happened up here this morning? said, I got up and started to wash the dishes and said, a boy spoke to me and said, go up to Billy's right away. And I said, Sister Boy, the angel of the Lord has appeared to me and told me, forget about the Nebia. It's going to be all right. And I'm going to have a meeting. It's going to consist of 300,000 people. God, I said, my ministry is just now beginning. I said, I want to base it. I want to pull that thing out from where it was and get rid of all these your leeches and things hanging on so I can get to the people and tell them what's the truth. That's right. I said, I'm tired of listening to man-made stuff anyhow. And I'm going to be where God can use me. I'm going to live right in that channel as long as I live. I went down there and they called me up. The man did said, you better come on down and pick up these canceled checks. On account of the income, said, you got to make out a return, which you don't have very much to pay, $7.50. But I had to go down and pick up the canceled checks as I started back through the bank. I saw all them fellows in his Hello, Brother Branham. Hello, Brother Branham, the tellers. And as I started back through... Something said to me, stop. And I felt something lay on my shoulder. And I thought, oh, just imagine that. You know, started on. I thought, no. 
No, there's something wrong. Who's looking at me now? I looked around. I didn't see anybody. I thought, Lord, you're near. What's happened? I seen little Bobby Gleason over there looking down like that, and something said, go over and talk to him. I said, how are you, Bobby? He said, just fine, Brother Branham. I guess. I said, look like you're sad this morning. He said, Brother Branham, look. He said, all my people nearly died with cancer. He said, I, it sure is the word I got it. He said, I'm bleeding through the bowels and everything. He said, you know the funniest thing happened, Brother Branham, Bench, you're standing here. He said, this morning at 3 o'clock, I woke up in the room and said there was a voice said to me, see Billy Branham today. I had all of his hand. I said, Bobby, everything's been going like that this morning. I told him about it. That's been about two, three months ago. I met him again the other day. He said, Brother Branham, I haven't had a bleeding from that day since. He said, I've been healed since that day. I tell her about Three confirmations. It shall come to pass. Remember that. You love him? What am I trying to say now? Jesus is here with us. I've kept you longer than I should. Yes, way longer. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. It's enthused. But it's true, you might understand, that the, the same God, how many believes that the pillar of fire, the pillar of fire that led the children of Israel, was the angel of the covenant? Let's see your hand. That was our Lord Jesus. Is that right? It was Christ, the anointed. Well, look, he appeared to Moses, but it wasn't because he is with Moses, he's with the whole church. Is that right? Could it be possible that this same pillar of fire that we see is taken here now, could that be the angel of the covenant? Could it be our Lord Jesus Christ? Could the angel of the Lord who appeared to Paul out there, who told Peter on the housetop all these things like did in the days of the Agamus and so forth? Isn't that the very analysis, the very symptoms, the very same thing that he did in the days in the New Testament? Then look, Christian, Holy Ghost still people, look this away. Then the sign of the Old Testament, Jehovah God, the pillar of fire, is with us. And the same God that was with the apostles, our Lord Jesus Christ, is with us undisputably through science, through the world, through the Christians, through the church, through everything is perfectly vindicated, and it's the same today. The both New and Old Testament, God of the Old Testament was Jesus of the New and the Holy Spirit of the day. You know that. Don't you believe that? To blaspheme the Holy Ghost today is just the same penalty or worse than blaspheming Jesus Christ or God the Father. Don't you believe that? Now, what more? Now, look, if the world calls us crazy, if the world thinks that we are just about half off up here, look, because those signs appear just of where I'm at and this angel of the Lord and so forth, that doesn't mean it's just me, friends. What does that mean? What is God trying to get to you? He's trying to get to you to this, that I am telling you the truth. He's vindicating me by his truth. See what I mean? And I'm telling you of Jesus Christ, and he's coming down confirming that I'm telling the truth. What kind of people should we be? Patriarchs as long to see this day. Wesley, Moody, Sankey, Finney, Dox, Calvin, all of them long for this day. And here we sit today, scared to move. Oh, my, my, my. Because the world makes fun of you. Because you got something out there, people criticize you. They did the same thing about Israel. Didn't the false prophet Balaam think surely that God would curse Israel because they've done just about as much as the whole in this church has done today? Every unclean thing that could be done and it could be done, they did it. But Balaam failed to see the blood on the altar. He failed to see the atonement made that was standing between Israel. Here's where it is today, people. You are God's called and chosen. I'm not ashamed to take myself with you. I'm numbered with you. In the way that's called heresy, so worship out of the God of our fathers. There's things in your church that I don't endorse. There's things that you do that I don't endorse. 
sometimes feel like I ought to give you a whipping for it and things like that, but all the time, right down in the bottom of it, you're my brother and sister. You're my own. When I love you, when there's a bunch of brands, we get back in the backyard and fight and smack one another, but don't let nobody else smack us. See what I mean? I'm with you. And you've got a truth because sincerely, without knowledge, maybe you're all scrupled up in this day or but you've come sincerely to God and believed on him and accepted in him and believed it. And God in return has given you the Holy Ghost as a witness. And now leaders has come in with denominations and broke you up in sectarianism and caused you to hate your brother and turn this way and that way. Don't want that thing anyhow. Look. Notice, but all the time, no matter if you belong to the assembly of God or the church of God or the pilgrim holiness, whatever it is, if you're born again, you're brothers and sisters in Christ. And as long as the devil can keep you separated and angry at one another, 